this video was originally recorded at the annual Buddha and the Yogis retreat at Menla in Phoenicia, New York. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menla.us. Has everyone got one now? Yes. Sort of? Yes. Some version? Yes. yes? Yes. Because I want to hear a loud voice <laughs> chanting. Because anybody's lips are not moving, <laughs> Atara will be upset. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Hail Tara, swift one champion, your glance like a flash of lightning. Arising like a tear born statements from the mountains of the face. All hail whose face transcended as a hundred full harvest moons. Ablaze with your laughing light rays like a host of a thousand stars. All hail infinity alive. Triumph of Buddha, brain no queen. Honored by all victor children. Sporting all transcendent virtues, hail you who fill all space of realms with fierce boom and to Tara sounds. You tread upon the seven worlds, controlling them all completely. Hail you adored by the all god, Indra, Agni, Brahma, Marut, honored by all demons and zombies, fairies, angels of the goblins. Hail you, your fifth shot and pat sounds, crush enemies, magic diagrams, feet planted in the bowman's stance, fierce glances, blazing, searing flames. Hail you, O great awesome Dude, crusher of satanic champions, lotus face so fiercely frowning, quickly annihilated all foes. Hail you, whose heart is beautiful, with hands in the three jewel gesture, their exquisite royal wheel marks, shining their light rays everywhere. Hail you, garlands of light cascade from your diadem glow with joy. Smiling, laughing with Tutta, the dominated devil realms. Hail you, who have power to summon the whole earth's guardian spirit host. You dance, you frown, you sound, your home, deliver us from disasters. Hail you, whose diadem shines brightly, moon crescent in dark lock hairdo, with Amitabha seated in its shining polar constant light rays. Hail you, stand wreathed in cosmic flames, supernova conflagrations. In the moment stands joy power, Incinerate the wheel of foes. Hail you who sharply clap your hands and stamp your foot upon the ground. Crown fiercely roar the sound of home and shatter all seven underworlds. Hail you blissful, gentle, beauty, luxurious, peaceful in nirvana. Glorious with Swaha and with Om, destroy all great atrocities. Hail you whose power is total joy, who rend the bodies of all opposed. With your magic syllables, ten om dare tu dare tu re swaha, and your ferocious spell, spell of hum hum namastare namo hare hum hare swaha. Hail you swift ladies, stamp your foot spring forth from your home shaped seed. You shake the whole threefold planet Mount Meru Kailash Mandara. Hail you who holds the Hare Mark Moon like a divine lake in your hand. Totally extracts all poisons, pronouncing Tara Tara Fe. Hail you, honored by God Indra, Brahma, all gods and horse spirits, with honor of joy ecstatic. You stop all conflict and bad dreams. Hail you, your shining sun, moon eyes penetrate like lightning flashes. Hara, hara, and tutara, you lay all fatal fevers. Hail three reality created, 
In the bowman stands joy powered, incinerate the wheel of foes. Hail you who sharply clap your hands and stamp your foot upon the ground. Frown fiercely, roar the sound of home, shatter all seven underworlds. Hail you, blissful, gentle beauty, luxurious, blissful in their honor. Glorious with Swaha and with all, destroy all great atrocities. Hail you whose power is total joy, who rend the body of all foes. With your magic syllables ten, O die to battle is Waha. And your ferocious spell of hum, hum, namo, sade, namo, hare, hum, hare, swaha. Hail you swift lady, snap your foot, spring forth from your home, shake speed. You shake the whole threefold planet, not Zeru, Kailash, Manda. Hail you who holds the hair bark moon like a divine lake in your hand. Totally extracts all poisons, pronouncing Tara, Tara, Pei. Hail you, honored by God Indra, Rama, all gods and horse spirits. With the armor of joy ecstatic, you stop all conflict grand dangers. Hail you, your shining sun moon eyes, penetrate like lightning flashes. Hara, Hara, and Tuta, you lay all fatal fevers. Hail three reality created, flowing bliss for Shiva Shakti. Bless swiftly, you overcome rushing demons, zombies, ogres. Over. So I'm there will just do two today because not everybody has the right thing. Tomorrow I'll see to it. This mantra, together, this mantra rooted hymn of praise, 21 fold salutation. Sing it ardent, true and thoughtful in devotion to the goddess. Remember it well at evening or at dawn upon arising. It gives safety, stops every sin, reverses all evil fortunes. One will soon be well anointed by 17 million victors, enjoying thereby much glory, at last achieving Buddhahood. Remembering it, one is released from effects of vilest poisons, animal, plant, or mineral, whether taken in food or drink. Reciting it three sevens twice completely stops the suffering. 
from addictions, demons, fevers, poisons, even in other beings. Who wants a child will soon get one, who wants wealth will soon receive it. One will fulfill all one's wishes and will not suffer any harm. <laughs> Tahara, oh, where are you with the Republicans? <laughs> okay, now, 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 do you have a, does everyone have this page? It's page number six in the handout. And it's called The Three Principles of the Path. It's the main topic for today. So we're going to do that chant every day. I think actually I'm going to fix it for chanting a little bit. <sighs> okay, you have this. It's called Three Principles of the Path. Yes? Yes. Yes? Okay, good. So this uh, is said to have been um, something like the... So that does work, does it? Okay. Something like the uh, three uh, seeds of the great, what's called Lamrim Chim. The great stages of the path uh, to enlightenment, written in the early 1400s by uh, the Renaissance, uh, Tibetan Renaissance man, Lama Tsongkhapa. And um, it said this, this particular set of verses were revealed to him on the roof of the central cathedral of Lhasa by Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of Wisdom. Which, oh, where's the guy with the beard? <laughs> oh, I don't see it. Oh, there he is. I was going to ask about wisdom yesterday. So this is a, and, the, and these three principles are said to be the indispensable prerequisite for practicing the esoteric teaching. If you have these three, they're equivalent of uh, hundred thousands of prostrations. You don't have it, Michelle? It's not in your thing? This no. one? Uh, I have the part. What? You I'm okay. <laughs> I, I don't think I have one more. No, I don't. Oh, no. Oh, thank you. Okay. So, reverence to all the holy mentors, gurus. Actually, the Tibetans did a nice thing when they translated the word guru. And uh, in a way, it was a maybe a, shows a difference in the cultures. The, uh, the uh, guru in Sanskrit means heavy. It's an, adje as an adjective, it means a heavy. It's the opposite of light, you know, heavy and light. It's like a heavy weight. And India was, after all, is, remains, a uh, patriarchal culture, where the patriarch is the heavy in the household, and the guru is the heavy in the school. And of course, it means many other more nice things than just the heavy. But this idea of kind of heavy, like something heavy on the top of your head. And uh, in Buddhism, in general, you know, Buddha rebelled against orthodoxy in his life. You know, he was told by everyone, all the priests, and uh, his father, who was a king, uh, when he had his own son, uh, when uh, Yashoda uh, uh, delivered their son Rahula, beautiful baby boy, uh, he did then that in the old system, then that's when the, the warrior, Kshatriya king, can uh, abdicate in favor of the crown prince, his son, and then the son has a new crown prince. So, you know, they can't force the son, the crown prince, to be king until he has a son, in the old system. So then Buddha was ordered to do that, and he said, excuse me, Dehan, but, you know, I know you want to go to Florida and retire, and you want me to run the country, but I'm going to retire right now to attain enlightenment. And sorry, you know, but uh, he didn't promise him to have to wait for the grandson actually, which was wise, because the grandson became a Buddha himself, a monk, you know. Poor father, was, the grandfather was very upset, Buddha's father. So anyway, it was a big rebellion, it was a super shock. And Buddha's wife was deeply upset and distressed at first. And um, they were a very loving couple, and they had a beautiful boy. And then it's a, one of the ancient, in the ancient Indian classical poetry, they make much of it. And even, I would say that in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna, if you compare the poetical renditions of the Buddha's 
refusal to serve in orthodoxy and to do his duty as a warrior and run the kingdom, etc. And you juxtapose the arguments of the psychiatrists, which were the Brahmin counselors and ministers of the king, besides the king himself, and the Buddha's answers to them, you have, you have Arjuna's wish to get out of that chariot and not have that battle, and Krishna rejecting all of his arguments and forcing him to stay in the Arjuna thing. Which, so the Bhagavad Gita actually, which is in its late recent form, a kind of interpolation in the Mahabharata, um, is sort of putting a stop to all these Buddhists hundreds of years later in India, actually. And uh, it comes in, you know, it's, it's a long story of how that worked. But um, precisely Arjuna is saying all the things the Buddha said about how he didn't want to go kill his cousins and all this. And he, well, there wants to be a better way than this battle, you know. And uh, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, you know, the Mahabharata has this double thing where the individual verses come from oral epic poetry and they glorify the warriors and they glorify the caste system and they glorify saving the family, etc. But Vyasa, the brilliant guy who puts it together, he puts it together in such a way that at the end of the war of the Mahabharata, the family is destroyed anyway, completely. All the families, even the families of the winners. So it's that double thing where the compiler gives an opposite message in a more later, more elaborated, and more, uh, more post axial age, peaceful, aspiring culture, peace aspiring culture. Let's say. Okay, so I will explain as best I can. So, so, um, uh, so therefore, these are, you know, Buddhism people think it's an ism, it's a religion, but, and it is a religion for people who don't practice it. <laughs> if you don't practice it, and you just believe that people who do are doing a good thing, and you just sort of, you're devoted to them, or you like them, then it becomes a religion. And so it is to them. But if you practice it, which was mostly the monks and nuns in the ancient time, few lay people, but mostly monks and nuns, because of the low level of literacy in the ancient agricultural culture, um, then you realize it is a, an education system rather than a religion. In other words, it's really against beliefs. It's critiquing, actually one of the six addictions is Conviction is called a uh, view, you know, rigid view. It doesn't say wrong view, actually. It just says any view held in a religion way, a uh, rigid way, where you're sort of your life is your view rather than itself, your life. You know. And um, uh, so it, it's an education of opening your mind and not closing it around a belief system like we define in modern times, religion is defined. So, so therefore, I'm just saying that preliminarily to this, reading these three principles of that. And in talking about Tantra, which mainly we do in comparison with Hatha Yoga tradition, which is really tantric, although it reports to be non-tantric, but it is really tantric, chakras and all of that, that means. Um, uh, but the, this, the, these are the necessary educations that are involved. It, it, and this is a very short form of, okay? So I will explain as best I can the key import of all the victor's teachings, the Buddha's teachings. You know, Buddha is called Victor Jinnah uh, because it's a, a culture in his time which was militarized. He was in the warrior class. But he's the one who most strongly, Mahavira of the Jains also, and also some of the Upanishadic great teachers, but they, they changed the important victory as being a victory over yourself rather than victory and conquest over others. And, um, but they, they call them Jinnahs anyway, victors. Path praised by all the holy bodhisattvas. Bodhisattva, as a, actually, how many of you know a lot about Buddhism? Not so many. How many of you, how many of you don't know anything about <laughs> So the rest are in between, like me. Okay. So bodhisattva, then you know, bodhisattva sattva means a being. Or it can, it, you know, it can also mean the light energy, you know, in the three gunas of the Sankhya. But uh, Sattva means a being, and also it can mean a hero or a warrior. So a Bodhisattva is, uh, the Tibetan is translated as a Jang Chub Senpa. So they had the idea of a hero, spiritual hero. They translate Sattva. And Bodhi means enlightenment. So that means a hero for enlightenment, or a heroine for enlightenment, one who has made that their 
their battle, their, their war against their own inner addictions and delusions and so forth, to become enlightened. Because that's a bodhisattva. And it doesn't mean necessarily a high being. A beginner bodhisattva can be very unaccomplished, but it just means one who has that orientation. Best entry for those destined to seek freedom. So listen with clear minds, you lucky people, who aspire to the path that pleases Buddhas and strive to make meaning of liberty and opportunity, not being addicted to the pleasures of cyclic living. And um, so to make a meaning of your liberty and opportunity now, uh, this is a really two very key concepts, which is what human life is described, a certain type of human life, the type of human life that you have, that we have, is described as, a, as the precious jewel of a human embodiment endowed with liber liberty and opportunity. And of course, not all human societies do endow people with liberty to use their lives to develop themselves, that means, or to free themselves from sufferings of different kinds. They don't necessarily allow that. You have to work for the society. You have to fit in. You have to you know, do your duty, you know, serve in the army, serve in the, in the maternity ward, serve in whatever the society considers productively essential to itself. And so they don't offer that. And then opportunity, of course, part of opportunity is defined as that which, you know, knowing that there is such a thing as freedom from suffering, which is not really obvious, actually. People, people don't necessarily believe there is such a thing. It takes a little bit of imagination to think of it. Of course, there's a rel freedom, relative freedom, temporarily alleviation or relief from this pain or that pain. And uh, all religions and all actually sort of all global worldviews or overall worldviews do tell people that there's a way out, including secularism. Secularism pretends that it doesn't need to, but actually in doing so, it does. And, you know, in other words, religions say, no, you should expect to suffer in life, because that's the nature of life. But then in heaven, if you're good and you, you join the church or you join the mosque or you join the the synagogue, or you join the temple, or you join whatever it is, religiously, then you'll be taken care of after you die. You'll go to heaven, you'll go to the happy hunting ground, you'll go to the ancestors' heaven, whatever the version people have. So they, they do that, although they don't say you can be free of suffering in life, actually, except some temporary alleviation of some temporary pain. Uh, that's a unique Buddha thing, actually, initially, that you can be completely free of suffering in life, that's a really strange idea. It's not even credible. Do you think? Do you believe that if someone told you, oh, take this or do that and you'll never have suffer, and yet you just have a life like you have, but you won't suffer at all? Do you think you actually believe that? How <laughs> you believe that? <laughs> we don't, necessarily. And, um, and therefore, when there's an opportunity involved where there has been some tradition or some teacher, and not all human societies are aware of this, that actually has discovered their way to such a freedom. And actually many people have decided that it's worth a try, and many people have ratified that, that announcement or that decision and have found such a freedom through history. And, but it still doesn't mean that other people won't believe it, or won't try for it, or et cetera, or discouraged about it. And um, it, still, it doesn't mean that we won't have a society like America where major, major product, billion dollar thing is selling pills against depression. <laughs> barrels of them, giant barrels of antidepressants in, the, in this country. For example, although we're supposed to be the happiest country. <laughs> right? Aren't we? No? Way down. Way down. Well, that's in the recent science of happiness, yeah, which is good. Uh, Holland and um, uh, Denmark tend to win, the Scandinavian countries. And uh, about states in America, Colorado, California, <laughs> Oregon, they're on the way with the desperate weird action happening from the Justice Department. <laughs> so, okay, so not being a, so now listen, so yeah, lust for existence chains all bodied beings. Cyclic living, by the way, yeah, cyclic living doesn't just mean, cyclic living does mean Bill Murray's Groundhog Day. <laughs> it's exactly what it means, but it doesn't mean it in that you just go and your clock resets and you get up again and then the groundhog is coming out like in Bill Murray's thing. He made it within this life of Bill Murray. 
But cyclic living means you'll be reliving another life after you die. And whatever you did wrong this life, whatever you didn't learn, whoever you harmed, whatever it is, they have to repeat dealing with that situation until you eventually do it. That's what cycle. You know, samsara, the word samsara really just means the cycle. It does. The total flow, actually. It's the total flow where you're helplessly sw driven and repeating and repeating the same thing. And if you just are being driven and you have no self-independent uh, will power about it, then you're, you're completely flowing in the, in the realm of suffering. So the, the cycle, samsara, is something they don't like the sound of in the, in the Buddhist um, worldview. Okay, lust for existence chains all bodied beings. Addiction to cyclic pleasures is only cured by transcendent renunciation. So first of all, seek transcendence. So this is this word, Ngerjoma, in Tibetan, and Nirjana in Sanskrit. And it means like um, definitely going to escape from the cycle. And it has two forms, yeah, but although they're both similar in that there's a definite escape involved. And uh, the, the one form is this definite escape with the idea that nirvana is somewhere else. And, you know, connects, unfortunately, to the misunderstanding of Buddhism in countries that are newly introduced to it, of the Buddhist inner science. The misunderstanding that, yes, okay, there could be an immediate escape of suffering. We could completely be free of suffering in this life. But that would mean escaping from this body, escaping from this relative world to a transcendent world, to our transcendent realm called Nirvana. Even though Nirvana is carefully distinguished by Buddha as not being heaven, and it's carefully distinguished as not being one of the four formless or immaterial states, like, you know, trance states, that you can become a deity in for millions of years. It's not identified with the Brahma heavens and all the elaborate, the, 23 different heavens that the, that the layers of heaven that Buddhist cosmology divides uh, the, the after death possibility or the another kind of life, life is a god. And the yogis can reach those in meditation uh, without leaving their human body also. But, uh, and there, therefore in a way that kind of meditation in the Buddhist education system is considered a little bit dangerous, the super quietist meditation because then you have the ability as a yogi or a yogini to go into planes of like Brahma godliness or absolute space, you know, infinite space, absolute nothingness, a seeming place of nothingness. And although of course it isn't nothingness, it's a place that seems like nothingness. And um, you, have, they have, you can have that ability just by developing serious and extreme transic concentration. And, and the danger, from the Buddhist point of view, evolutionary point of view, is that then you think that's nirvana, and you get stuck there as a deity of it, and then you, you're back out after a long time, according to their view, many, many years. Many, Thoreau touches on it. If the, if some of you must have read Walden, the book by Thoreau. At the end, there's this thing about a guy who makes a walking stick for a friend. It takes him aeons to make. By the time he makes it, then he doesn't know where his friend went. There, he gets that from, the, from a certain Indian book at the time. Thoreau did, 100, almost 100 years ago. And um, so it's like that when you go in a formless realm. Because when you're in a realm like that, a more or less unconscious realm, you have no sense of time. So a really long time can seem like a moment. Like when you sleep at night and then you have to wake up suddenly. But it is eight or nine hours later. Okay, so th those are just preliminary. Now, this again, liberty and opportunity are hard to get, and there is no time to life. Keep thinking on this, and you will turn off your obsession, maybe I should translate it, with this life. So this is a very important foundational thing. Um, your special type of human embodiment that you all have, that we all have, it's not that easy to get. Uh, animals without language, of which there are zillions, they uh, don't have this kind of liberty and opportunity. Uh, they just have to follow their evolutionary niche, and they have to hunt their food, 
and subsistence and not be hunted for food by others and uh, you know domesticated or wild it's a it's a rough rough life they have no such liberty and opportunity and they're pretty much hard wired within their thing but not completely they also have choice that's how they move it from in Buddhist biology that's how beings move from one animal species to another um, sort of mounting up in a higher evolution and the higher evolution is a human is high gods are higher than humans but an angel types you know things like that some demons but uh, they are a little bit too high so they feel invulnerable so they don't use their life it's not a good place for them to use their life to attain enlightenment to attain real freedom full freedom from suffering because they're sort of too comfortable and they're too they just uh, they're just too too indulged you know and they won't really develop whereas humans have the same intelligence as that but they and can therefore transform themselves can consciously intervene in their evolutionary reactions and actions and they can they have more ability to make choices to improve their evolutionary condition their karmic condition um, and, but and they're vulnerable humans and they and we know how much it can hurt and we have you know our lifespan is not that long in this era actually some humans can live much longer uh, they say in Buddhist cosmology but anyway um, so that makes our life form very very ideal and um, and this we don't really feel that you know if you're a secularist oh yeah no, I wanted to say like a secularism also promises you freedom from suffering you realize that if people who like their secularism you know this world I'm a materialist I'm a scientific materialist my grandfather was like that um, they like that because they are promised freedom from suffering through annihilation and of course everyone every upstanding person says oh I don't I don't crave nothingness I don't crave annihilation but that would be deceiving themselves everyone craves annihilation every night if you've been up a long time and you're really tired, you want to be unconscious and you don't want to feel anything. You mean you you know you you've got confident you're going to wake up again, of course. So you're not it's it's not like you're dying. You don't call in all your relatives and say goodbye every night when you fall asleep. <laughs> but but you are happy to be unconscious and be not there, so to speak. And then people, all these addict people, addicted all these opioids and all this sort of thing, which is a worldwide thing, very widespread. They are seeking an annihilation of their sensitivity. So the materialist is promising you, who think you only have this life, and uh, that you will be free of suffering after death. So then, therefore, now continue to work in the factory or the, <laughs> the internet company or whatever it is. And uh, the university, the farm, <laughs> the ranch, whatever you work in. And you know it's kind of unbearable, and it's tiresome, and, and you know it's endless, and whatever. Each 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 rare layer of success then leads to another stress to achieve, and so on. Uh, but it's okay, and at least it's only one of them. It's only this one life you have to worry about staying relatively comfortable. Whereas in the great majority of human beings on the planet, actually throughout history, have basically considered continuity to be the rule of thumb. You know, someone who would say that there's a radical discontinuity and sort of the burden of proof is on them. You know? The one who would say something can become nothing. Right? Since no one's ever experienced something becoming nothing. Right? Has anybody ever experienced that? Did, is nothing a scientific discovery by modern science? Have they discovered that there's a nothing waiting for, you know, a good upstanding real estate developer who lives on 57th Street in New York? Is there anybody who has discovered that, or a Texan, that they're going to not be there after they die? Who has discovered that? On what evidence is that assurance based? In other words, can anybody give any evidence? I know, you know there is one evidence. This one guy at Bellevue Hospital, I was there, I wasn't an inmate actually. <laughs> but I visited there once, and there was a high level neuroscientist, one of those prize type winning types, and he was desperate to get the hell out of here brain in there and like see what it was like and uh, he got my brain in there and was disappointed it seemed too coherent for him he said and uh, uh, he didn't get the Dalai Lama but anyway he's, he's put electrodes on corpses and not detected any activity so that's he considered the discovery of nothing in a corpse's brain so that proved that the 
At death, the mind of the person was gone forever to him. But is that rational? Think about it. The claim, nobody claimed that the mind of the dead person staying in the brain like doing, you know, sun exercises. You know, the mind has left the body. You know, so naturally there's nothing there. But that doesn't mean there's no mind there, no mental activity. Doesn't mean there is no mental activity somewhere else. That's not proven. You know, you you can you can transmit over the internet some huge program or product, and it's no longer in your heart, and then you delete it in your hard disk, but it's still somewhere else. So the the rule of thumb in late in nature is that things have continuity. Your consciousness is kind of energy, right? And so all energy has continuity. So why is your consciousness the one energy that has no continuity, or is it no energy? Do you have no? Do you have a non-energy consciousness? Do you? Do you feel you do? We might. Actually, I was looking up because I'm writing a book on Buddhist science. I was looking up. Do you realize that energy and matter? You know the difference. Energy has no mass. That's the technical thing. So the energy has no size. It has. It doesn't have mass energy. Okay? That's energy and matter. That's the different definition. So something with no mass can affect things with mass. That means, even for physicists, right? Secularists, scientific materialist physicists. So therefore, I know I'm going on about this, but it is really the most important thing you could possibly think about in your entire life. Because even if we think, oh, I, oh yeah, I believe in reincarnation. I've been practicing the Dharma. I'm, I do yoga, I'm a Hindu, I'm a Buddhist. Not necessarily, or even Christians, you know, everybody has some kind of rebirth. Even the secularists, they just have a really boring one. <laughs> where they're just unconscious forever. But um, uh, even we have some belief about it, we are programmed to only think about ourselves and identify with ourselves as the, what we are doing as in this body. We are just, um, and when this body stops, that's it. So we're only concerned with the extent of this body. So that means we are somewhat slightly psychotic in the sense that we're somehow not present. We're present up to a certain point, then we're not present. And you might find in this the true source of inability to conquer global warming. It's not the Goat brothers. They're just one instance. You know, it's not, the, it's not the Robert Mercer. It's not the ridiculous uh, government that we have at the moment. It's, uh, it's this attitude that whatever it is in the future, you know, the, the whole metaphor they always use about the boiling frog, right? Doesn't know it's boiling until it's too weak and too hot to get out. Huh? But, you know, we, that, we got that cured because we're the boiling frog and we won't be there. We'll be dead before it boils. So we don't care that much. We care. They say, all oh, my grandchildren, you know, they all say it. But they don't really care about their grandchildren, obviously. Because they all, everybody knows, including all the oil owners, the Koch brothers, David Koch, Charles Koch, they know that they're wrecking the planet. They absolutely know that. But they don't care. They're making money as long as they're there. And they don't think they'll be there later. They'll not be reborn at some sort of, I told them once at an energy industry conference in Norway, I said, they will be reborn downstream from a refinery as some kind of fish with <laughs> skin and no scales and wriggling in toxic water. <laughs> and like trying to lay an egg and glowing green like Homer Simpson. <laughs> Homer Simpson fish downstream. And you know, they're Norwegians and they all eat weird fish, so they're like, oh. <laughs> they then applauded. They applauded. <laughs> and they have done nothing since. <laughs> well, something, but not much. Okay. My point is, there's no time, so the, the liberty and opportunity means this. Also, how valuable is your life to you? That's another question. We are supposedly all very upstanding and this and that, but are you, how much are you really valuing yourself? What is your worldview? What produced you? Are you a genetic product? In other words, you, you're a gene carrier. You're carrying a bunch of selfish genes around, and they're hopping. Around there's one biologist who worked at Emory with a bunch of Tibetan <laughs> in Dharamsala, a wonderful book he wrote called The Enlightened Gene. So he's just hoping 
<laughs> he's trying because the lamas are getting to him though, even though he you know he thinks they're backward and whatever, but he's annoyed about it. He's a very nice person. You know, the selfish gene. But the selfish gene is the usual model of the gene, right? If you're Dawkins. Is that, are you, is it very valuable to be the carrier of selfish genes from A to B and then your job is done? What is it, the materialist thing? 15 or 85 cents worth of cheap chemicals in a bag of water? That's what a human being is. These like communist countries where they would just kill off millions. Without a, without a, you know, like Stalin or Mao or somebody drinking like, like a lot of alcohol, and numbing themselves, and then just giving orders and killing like millions of people. Uh, they, because people, they, you know, it's unfortunate they, they die, but then once they're dead, they don't know they ever lived, so they're cool. No problem with me. There'll be no consequence to me. Was I'll die and I'll, I'll never live. You know, this is that psychotic attitude of the people who are not committed that they are a part of nature and will remain, their consciousness and sensitivity will remain a part of nature. And therefore nature will, has feedback loops, you know, and what they put out into it will come back to them. Okay? That's, that's a really huge, huge difference. And if you shift into that worldview, and then you realize that you have a time, you have a platform, you know, you have a hard drive, software, software drive, you have software and hard drive. So, wet, wetware, I call it, actually. You have wetware and software to do something conscious about your condition and develop a consciousness that you can learn to lucidly dream, you can investigate your own unconscious, you can not be driven by blind impulse and reactivity as much, you can diminish it by practicing mindfulness, by practicing yoga, etc. You can do these things and you don't know how many years you may have left, you know, because it can strike at any time. But whatever you have, you can make a big difference to your continuity by learning to more control your continuity, to master your mental process. And the subtlest processes in your being are the ones that will go on. You, you know, your, your bicep, if you lift weights or something, or you do something, that's not going to go on with you. you know. But your subtle nervous system, and then maybe the, what, what works in the subtle nervous system, your, your consciousness, your concentration, your, your ability to restrain being driven by this or that reactive impulse, that will go with you. Then you have the opportunity to create that, intensify your creation of that. If you, and, and that's immensely valuable to you. Why? Because all your future lives will be really grateful that you shaped up in this life. Because what, you, you, what happens through this life is determined by what you did in previous ones. And, you, and furthermore, if you then, you know the Darwinian vision is a wonderful vision actually. I, I used to like Carl Sagan in his Cosmos movie, you know, when he would do the walk in the cosmic calendar about the human being, you know, because if they have this, they have this, their scientific transposition of a new mythology of up from Precambrian slime, you know that one, Big Bang and the whole thing, and then a, it's their own version of Genesis that they have. And therefore it seems very plausible to people brought up in, in that kind of thing. And they, and they, um, and he used to walk on the cosmic month, you know, the calendar, and he would come to like, human beings came out at like five minutes to midnight. Of course there's an end. <laughs> and poor guy, the end is the end. You know? It relates to everything being at an end, you know. Which is not the case. There's no end. I have a book I call Infinite Life. Uh, which I like, one of the few books I wrote that I like afterwards when I read it. And uh, I have to, of course, to read it for some reason. And uh, when, I, when I did it, my editor was very, didn't like, hated the title, and they wanted to take it away from me. And then they, one of their arguments was, do you want to go around promising people infinite life? You don't really want to do that, do you? I says, no, I don't want to do that. I want to go around threatening them. <laughs> Precisely. Because that wakes you up to the power and value of this life. This whole thing about being in the now, that's a meaningless. It's just a rehearsal of being unconscious. If you think that the ultimate state of yourself is nothing, that's where you're headed, whether you're good or bad, then your time is not valuable. You can waste it. You can pass the time. You can do it. It doesn't matter. But if what you do in these moments of your conscious, human, choice-making, discriminating, what wisdom achieving, delusion overcoming life, if that makes a huge difference to you, 
of the endless consequences. Then she, then she said, well, why don't you call it infinite consequences? She tried that. <laughs> I said, no, I'll leave that to John Ashcroft. You can see what time, what time we had that conversation. I said, no, it's just infinite life. So it, once it's infinite, you have to book your reservations, your tent, your room, your massage, in the next life. And, the, and your body, you have to create it. How are you going to create How did you create your body? How did you get this human body? Then you go into the biological thing. It's, it's a bunch of genes, selfish genes that didn't do it. Selfish genes could never create a human being. It's too weird for selfish genes. Selfish genes would make it, they are little Pac-Man, munching around, you know, eating bacteria or something. I don't know what they do with it gene their way along, and then they, and then they, they want a big machine that looks just like them, right around eating everything. You know, like a rhinoceros, you know, a dinosaur, they never quit being a dinosaur. Some outer space, they get rid of dinosaurs. They got bored with being dinosaurs. We did. We got bored with being, being a dinosaur is really boring. Just think about dinosaur sex. <laughs> Talk on a blackboard. Caress. <laughs> The dinosaur caress. <laughs> so we're this weird, soft, vulnerable, we don't know what we're doing, completely deprogrammable, reprogrammable, brainwashable, and unbrainwashable entity. And that's our great virtue. That we, and very vulnerable also, so we know him in serious, you know. With soft skin, you know. No armor plate. And um, so, if you really think about that, and it takes time, you have to read literature about the former life stories of the Buddha. Um, you have to see, you imagine the different animals and what the, what, how, how a body can fit with an instinct, like an instinct to, an instinct of anger. You know, beauty, for example, comes to beings, and they become mammals and things because they become more altruistic, they become more gentle, and beauty is the restraint of aggression. You know? Beauty comes from the restraint of aggression. Ugliness comes from anger, from you know aggressive hostility. You know, therefore, therefore, predators tend to be ugly. I mean, we might say the tiger, tiger, burning bright, and all that, but Blake can write, but he wasn't really writing that a tiger was chasing him around London. <laughs> it would not look pleasant to him, that hungry tiger. Okay, so liberty and opportunity are hard to get. This is really critical. To your, it makes you really value yourself and your body where you, you're like a person who I don't have, to, I can't have time to waste my time because every minute of my life, as long as it lasts, it's, I can do something in that to shape all the minutes for self and others extremely with a limitless consequence. There's no end to the consequence of whatever little improvement I can make in any particular moment. Because I'm so, this is so valuable, the opportunity that I have. It really changes the way you live these moments, is what I'm saying. And then there's no time, then this involves meditating on death. And I think we'll do that, because it's hard for you to meditate on the biology, so let's meditate for a minute. Meditate on death. We're going to do that. This is the beginning of the spiritual path, it often, it often say. Although not in Buddhist, in the Buddhist method, education, the beginning is meditating on yourself and how valuable you are in a biological sense. You are an immensely valuable biological product of your own virtuous action, your own positive action in the sense of helpful to others, loving, friendly, pleasure producing. That is how you got to be what you are. And that's hard to do because of our warped view of biology by materialists, because of our materialist culture. But death we can meditate on. So there's said to be three roots of the meditation on death, which you now try to concentrate upon. And the first is uh, the certainty that you will die. So I meditate the certainty I will die. And the first thing that my mind will tell me when I start meditating on that, this is an analytic meditation, so don't mind if you think. It's okay to be thinking. It's a critically thinking meditation, analytic meditation. And it is a kind of a very important kind of meditation. Well, my mind says to me, of course I know I'm going to die. What is this? 
everyone does. I do it. But then you start to speak to your mind, and you say, yeah, but you act like you're going to be here next week, next year, after the 10 years. You're making all these plans. You're working so hard. You are living in denial that you're going to die, actually. You can tell your mind, your habitual mind, because you're a critical mind. And then the critical mind, your habitual mind will kind of sulk. And then imagine, then just really think what it means. That means, you know, you will not be drawing breath. That means you will lose all your family members, as far as relate your relations, your loved ones, your property, your house, your body, your visual experience, pleasures, your audio experience, your taste, your food experience, your touch, your smell experience. You lose all of that. You will withdraw into some sort of mental state without the senses. The body will fall asleep and you don't quite know what will happen to your consciousness. And hopefully you're already doubting a little whether it will just cease to exist. As Hamlet said, right, the sleep of death. But in that sleep, what dreams may come must give us pause. And we have shuffled off this mortal coil. So, the first root of meditating on death, on that there, that, that life has no time, is this root of sort of impressing upon oneself the certainty that one will die. And in a way, we resist doing it partially because when we do, it makes us realize that our attachments are actually not as important as we think they are. We're so obsessed with them, but they're actually not so, they will be lost. You know, that, that, that watch that we love, you know, that t-shirt that we like, it will, it will, we will not possess it. The face that we used to look at in the mirror, hair, you know, like muscles, you know, everything, we won't have it. So in a way, thinking that it's certain helps us release a degree of attachment to this process, the, the coarser elements of the physical process, and possession, and status, and name, and etc., etc. And of course, it's especially poignant when we have made some effort in the earlier meditation that we just engaged in discursively about feeling excited about how precious our human embodiment endowed with liberty and opportunity is. And what a great, a great equipment we, have, we are. What a great you know, opportunity we have to be a conscious, to become a conscious evolver, to know where we're going in a dream even, to use a dream creatively by being aware that it's a dream and we are staying in it. So when we've really gotten where we're we are actually practically in tears about what a precious thing our embodiment, our life is, we then realize we'll be losing it, for sure. It has a very powerful, the two together, powerful impact. And then the second route, we can then intensify it. In any one of these things, you could meditate for weeks, of course, and retreat. We are rehearsing it. And many of you may have, in your own way, done this kind of thing. Second thing is called the uncertainty of when we are going to die. 
and nobody expects to die when they do, can happen in any kind of seemingly innocent circumstance. At any age, sometimes sadly the young, very sadly the young die before the old. Sometimes very sadly the seemingly healthy die before the sick. Sometimes sadly the, those in safe places die before those in dangerous places, in wars and things. So there is no certainty at all. Any moment could be one's last, actually. Of course, as you get much older, this becomes much more real to you. But it can be anyone, younger, too. <clears throat> so it will certainly happen. We don't know when. So these infinitely present, precious moments of our present. Any of them could be our last. Not the ones that meant long, of course. Then this brings up great intensity if we meditate on this second root. Very sharp focus. And then third, we meditate that when we do die, the only thing that possibly we go on as is our consciousness. And therefore the subtlemost level of our being is where we need to make investment we can't take our possessions with us. We can't take our relations with us. We can't take our uh, friends with us. We can't take our places with us. We can't even take our body with us. But we go as our awareness. And you know, we fall asleep, we let go of everything. Every night we fall asleep. We just let go of our senses. We let go of our muscle control, we let go of pretty much everything, go unconscious, fall asleep, enter the clear light, actually, wonderfully. But then we have a dream. And in the dream, we normally are just an awareness of whatever happens in the dream. And we don't think about what when we see things in a dream, we have, must have eyes. So we're in some kind of subtle dream body that has eyes, that sees. And the way our brain, you know, materialists would say rightly, I think, our brain creates virtual eyes. Uh, we would say our mind uses the brain to create virtual eyes. When we hear someone say something in a dream, we have virtual ears. Sometimes you have touch in a dream, texture, more rarely. You can eat food if you're hungry, you might have a dream where you have taste. But we normally don't focus on what is, what, what is the embodiment that we have in a dream. And when we wake up, we sort of assume, well, it's just because our regular senses in the body that is a bunch of regular senses. But not necessarily. Remember the great Taoist sage Zhuangzi, he said, last night I dreamt I was a butterfly. <coughs> and today I'm not sure that I'm a whether I'm a butterfly dreaming I'm a human, mm -hmm. or whether I, was, I am a human who had a dream that I was a butterfly. So he kind of was deeply conscious in both ways, really. But, but anyway, but my point here, at this point it is, Whatever that subtle awareness that it rises as a dream awareness, that's the area that we'll, we will go as if we go. You know, maybe what I was wrong, maybe we don't. You know, maybe we, that's the end of it. But he insisted that we do. And that's what all of the other great 
enlightened beings have said so as well. So modern ones who think they're modern Buddhists claim that they don't need it, but they're just completely confused. So, ding. so then meditating this way, you should feel a little more free. <laughs> there you are alive, but you're alive knowing you're going to not be. And that's a very different thing. And, you know, these kind of critical thought meditations are debates with yourself. In the Buddhist tradition, even in Zen, which purports to be no thinking kind of meditating, the way it tends to be taught, but they have what they call dharma combat, where they debate, they argue something between master and disciple, or sometimes between different disciples. And what that is, is to generate doubt by debating and seeing your reasons for why you think what you think, and having others challenge them and then see weakness in those reasons. This is developing the intensity of your critical thinking. And then when you meditate using vipassana, the word vipassana, the famous word vipassana, means critical meditating. And then you, if you've debated with others in language and in text and in study, then you're, you can debate with yourself. And then you can actually change your views. You can criticize your deluded delusions and you can develop your wisdom. And, and you can open your closed-mindedness and develop open-mindedness and so on. So what happens here is that they say if we really, if we really appreciated our human embodiment, if we understood how it biologically how it came to be, and what was our role in making it come to be, not just our parents' role, our species' role, genes' role, all these other things, material, you know, environment's role, but our own role. How do we dream ourselves into this in life, in other words, into this life form that we have? I really appreciate that the effort that we've made and how valuable what we have created is as being us. And then we realize we'll lose it. And then we'll lose it in a way where what goes will, be, will not be the thing, the process that we normally focus on. Because we normally focus on exterior things. We have our jobs, we have our, we have our entertainments, we have our whatever it is. We focus on a lot of outward things. This deep inner thing, we don't usually make our major investment of time in the day, of effort in life, if we're in the week, we don't usually do it. But we will, combining these two, and they say, and furthermore, he says, you will turn off your interest in this life. And uh, that means that you know, all our focus of how am I going to get through however many years I have to live, which in itself is living in denial that I could live no years. And then we, we're not just, that doesn't become the sole focus, in other words, when we do these two things. Uh, awareness of death, that means no time to life, that's impermanence. And awareness of preciousness of life, where you begin with. You just do death and impermanence without first challenging the materialist devaluation of our human lives. Immense devaluation that this creates this tremendous depression in materialist minds. The real root of it is that psychosis, that I'm nothing and it all amounts to nothing and why am I bothering? When we figure that out, we, we are no longer only focused on whatever remaining period of time we think we might have at this time. And then next step, we, is that we have to do this quickly, I don't want to spend the whole retreat on this, but this is the foundation. And then next step is, contemplate the inexorability of evolutionary effects and the sufferings of life over and over again and you will turn off any kind of excessive interest in future lives. And what this means is, it's the inescapability of cause and effect. The Buddhist worldview, you know, the, the, what the Buddha calls realistic worldview, the first of the branches of the Eightfold Path of achieving freedom from suffering, achieving nirvana in the Buddhist education system, is adjusting the worldview or belief system. And the one belief system that the only thing that one is asked to really deal with is causation. 
which should be surprising, I think, because we were all thinking of Buddha as a religious founder, you know, like Moses or Jesus or something. And then it and then can be seen that way by, as I said, those who are not really using the education system. But if you see him as someone teaching a therapy and education, first step is adjusting the attitude. And adjusting the attitude about causation, why is that? Why is the Buddha celebrated as, as discovering causation? 20, eight, eight, according to Tibetans, 28, 900 years ago. According to Western modern people, 2,500, but nobody really knows for sure. But anyway, uh, why? What is the big deal about causation? Well, isn't there a place in your own sense of yourself, if you honestly reflect? Don't you have something in your mind that is the unchangeable you? When you remember something 10 years ago, 20, when you successfully get back into the event, maybe you look at a, a family snapshot of party at the beach or whatever it might be, and then you remember being that person that you see there, which you thought was you, although it's quite different looks than you do now 20 years later. But there's something that's the same in the, con the center of your consciousness you feel has not changed over that time. We all have that feeling, don't we? That's where our continuity comes from, we think. Do you find that easily in yourself? I think so. It shouldn't be hard to find. You know? Memory lane, when you do it, it really especially you get it. You, know? you know, look at the snapshot of the pocket. At least that's when I get it. Oh yeah, that was me there. <coughs> then you sort of inhabit that presence. You remember the you see or you think you do, but you know, you remember it. And then there's something about you that's just exactly the same as now, you think. And therefore, like we all take as a truism, we say, oh, people never change. No, you ever hear that? You know, from Uncle Joe at Thanksgiving dinner, the Republican? <laughs> people never change. You know? People say that. So there is a point of that. So in other words, there is a point where we carry what we assume to be our real self, which is something that never changes. But yet it's our personal thing. And of course, we personally are changing all the time, but there's some place there that therefore outside of the causation of our changes, that are inside of it, that's immune to it, that's the real us, our identity. And the word identity, idem means the same in Latin. The titi thing means, the iti thing is an abstract suffix. So identity means sameness, basically. It's, a, it's the real you that's always been you and always will be type of thing. And that's what... Um, that's that we're outside the flow of causation. So if we sort of accept the real, that it's realistic to accept that it, everything is caused in the relative world, that everything is relative in the relative world, that everything is caused in the relative world, then that means we're adopting an attitude and a worldview that subtly, perhaps at first, erodes that feeling of being this independent, separate thing which makes life so problematic, you know? There's this thing in the head that it's just always me, you know? And then when, when I look in the mirror, or I see, and I see that I'm falling apart slowly and think the decay of old age, it freaks me out because, you know, people say, oh, I feel like I just, like I did when I was 16, you know? I'm 94 now. <laughs> and they say that, and they feel like that, actually. They do. And they suffer, therefore. So, except the, 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 the deciding to be practical and deal with causality is the only sort of belief stricture, you can say. That's what constitutes realistic belief. Because once you really accept in the, in the relational world, which after all is the only world you know, right? You've never had any knowledge of anything that wasn't relational, have you? You can't. But knowing something is related to it, right? So everything that you know has always been relational. And so once you accept that uh, that's the case, then suddenly you're in this vast plane where maybe the, the idea of an uncaused cause is just asinine. It's just a ridiculous thing that someone says to make themselves feel 
comfortable. Oh yeah, this, it only goes far that far back. I don't have to worry about anything further. And then there's some sort of ending has to be put there too. Like there'll only be that. I don't have to deal with it for that long. So there's this compulsion to enclose yourself in time, to a first beginning and a, and a total ending, and uh, which is just unrealistic. That's not realistic. Unclosed cause is nonsense, right? If there is an unclosed cause, if something could happen with no cause, then it would never be happening everywhere. Be big banging all around. We'd never have a minute to take a breath. The right, what, nothing to stop it from happening at all times because it has no cause. It's simple, practical reasoning that is. So, so when we do that, then we think that there are going to be effects of everything. Everything, every cause will have an effect. Every effect itself is a cause of something else. And then we realize that no matter how much we ever we have made in this life, and then there's a this second thing, and the sufferings of life means. You reflect about the gods, you reflect about heaven, you reflect about the most pleasant thing you can possibly think of, your most ideal situation or circumstance, you could be in the, the best thing, the nicest thing, and still there would be suffering, you know, sort of the way you are to experience things, you know, you would, you would see that. And, um, and then you would not so much, you, you would lower the priority, return off your interest means you lower the priority. So it doesn't mean that you don't seek a better future life. To be born with a nice family and a nice planet and a nice, that isn't doing global warming, that isn't overpopulated, that isn't filled with torture and holocaust and things. You might aspire to that perfectly rationally, but it would be not your highest priority because you would know that there would be no such thing that would be the complete freedom from something. And you're sort of beginning to suspect that there may be such a thing as complete freedom from suffering. But anyway, when you then, by constant meditation, your mind will not entertain a moment's wish, even for successes of this life, and you will aim for freedom day and night, then you experience transcendent renunciation. So this is why, in Asia, under the, under the immense power of the Buddha's realization, and all of the institutions that came from it. India was transformed, and India was not India. India was many different nations, hundreds of them. And all the rest of Asia, and even came into Iran. Where is that Imam? Where is that Omid? Oh, yeah, there she is. Came even to Iran. You know, Mani, the Manichae and Mani, he, he claimed to be the disciple of Zoroaster, Buddha, and Jesus, all three. So they all knew all about it, even in the West. You know, it went to the West, even though people in the West think everything happened in the West. Actually, it, it, did, it was influenced by the great culture of India, the wealthiest country, the California of ancient Eurasia, was <laughs> India. And uh, so from this uh, fact, so many people, when they realized this, they dropped out. Those economies were capable of supporting them. They tried to drop out in Europe too, but they got instantly executed or done in because they couldn't. They felt they couldn't support. And in China, they also didn't until around 800 years after India. They didn't have any monks or nuns. But people, when they realized that, they immediately don't want to have to be just feeding the body of this life, feeding the name of this life, feeding the property of this life. They didn't want to do it anymore. They didn't want to work on Maggie's farm. They wanted to develop themselves. They realized that the meaning of the human life is to evolve as a human being into an enlightened human being. And the human platform is the best platform to do it. And one after another, they just met Buddha. And they even, they say it, I mean, I don't know if it really happened. I think it probably did, but I, I would, if I saw it, I would faint. But many people who met Buddha, and they heard this sort of thing, they just said, oh, I want, to, I take refuge in that, and he said, Ehi Bhikkhu, or Ehi Bhikkhuni, and their hair flew off, their clothes flew off, they got orange robes given by the gods, and they were like bhikshus, just like that. They just said, Ehi Bhikkhu, come hither, Bhikkhu. Bhikkhu, and Bhikkhu doesn't mean monk or nun, 
and bhikshuni doesn't mean man, it means mendicant. And mendicant means someone who's on lifelong MacArthur Fellowship. <laughs> Which means they just have a bowl and people come and fill it. And they are very modest in demand. They only ask for lunch. Only free lunch. The Protestant anathema. <laughs> no dinner, no breakfast, just lunch. And because they only want to keep the body going, to use the platform to learn, to think critically, to meditate, to develop this inner being, this inner mind, you know, this starts the coarse, subtle, and super subtle mind, get through the unconsciousness mind. So that's what it means. It doesn't mean that, you know, so that's you don't entertain, in other words, you don't make a top priority any kind of success of this life, and you aim for freedom day and night. That's what you realize. That's, that's the base, that's, that's the only worthwhile thing. That's the only real fun is freedom. Then it says, so then you experience transcendent renunciation. This, if you ever liked Castaneda, if any of you are old enough that you ever read that during those days, this is what Don Juan used to call the warrior's abandon. You're sort of not so attached to everything. You lower the, your priority of your attachments. And you really realize that what your main aim is, is freedom. And because it is achievable. It doesn't necessarily take many lifetimes. It doesn't necessarily take, you don't have to know, necessarily wake up to it at an early age, although you're lucky if you do. But, and you might be already advanced, but whatever you do, it can have an eternal fruition. And then you, that's, what, that's all you want to do. When you have this realization, that's when you have transcendent renunciation. And actually, I took me 45, maybe 40 years to realize you know, we think of renunciation as some sort of masochistic person. Or, oh, they don't, they don't like, they don't want to have like a little something nice, and they don't care about what they wear, and they don't care what they look. Oh, they really like freak out. You know, must be like a depressed or something. Not at all. <laughs> the renunciant person is the person who actually has compassion for themselves. Finally, they found someone to have compassion for, namely themselves. <laughs> Why? I mean, think about it, what you get all anxious about. What, what are the things you make you really, you get, you get this news and you get really anxious about something? Well, maybe some of the state of some other person, of course, it could be, you know? Maybe it's some job promotion or some financial loss or gain or, you know, whatever it might be, a reputational thing. But then they really, we really get wired up about it. Ooh, you know, presses all our buttons, you know? But, but they, none of them are, are this essentially important. Actually. That's transcendent renunciation. And so the, you know, we still would take care of somebody in trouble or something happening. It doesn't mean that. We're even better at it. It's like in poker. If you, if you kind of detach from the spoils, or like they said in the Gita, you're detached from the reward, you can do the fight the battle better. You can bluff better. You're much cooler. Your opponent can't read your things. You're more effective, actually, in, in interactive things if you have dropped out in a certain way. You're not like deeply gripped by your obsessions. So transcendence without the spirit of enlightenment, that's how I translate what they call bodhicitta. In, they use the Sanskrit word. Chitta just means mind, or it can mean spirit. Uh, it has it mean different levels of mind. It itself can be defined different ways. And bodhi means enlightenment. So I call it spirit of enlightenment. But you could say mind of enlightenment, will, to, but it's composed of a will to enlightenment, and it's composed to a sense of the presence of enlightenment. Both. What's called the aspiring spirit of enlightenment and the present spirit of enlightenment, the functioning spirit of enlightenment. And um, so it cannot generate the supreme bliss, in other words. And here's where you begin to get this, uh, what's called the Mahayana in Buddhism, the universal vehicle attitude, which in a way, you now in this thing about escape and transcendent renunciation, some people cannot imagine being perfectly blissful without any suffering, and yet still in relationalities, still dealing with Uncle Joe, with a, with a bad president, with whatever it is, you know, 
when we're dealing with, the, you know, Iraq, the Middle East, the insane world, that global warming, they can't imagine it. So, so they imagine a state of non-suffering as some kind of completely inconceivable thing apart from all relationalities. They think therefore that nirvana is apart from samsara. And the Buddha allowed them to do so. Although he told them actually no about, he describes states that they are seeming states apart from causality. And he said those are not nirvana. So he, so he kind of didn't quite give them the real crunchy satisfaction of, yeah, nirvana is like beyond that barrier, you know, beyond the sound barrier, beyond the space barrier, beyond whatever. He wouldn't quite let them do that, although he knew they would keep misunderstanding things that he said as to thinking that. But, so he, but then his deeper one is where this is nirvana already. That's the deeper one. He, after all, attained it under the Bodhi tree. He said, I'm free of suffering. Hey, wow! Profound, peaceful, luminous, without any complication, and immortal like an elixir of immortality is the is this reality I have discovered he said but um, and so some people realize kind of we are interconnected everything is interconnected you see the idea that you can catapult yourself out of the relative into the absolute is a kind of uncritical idea because the absolute means the opposite of the relative. Therefore, there's no point of relationship between the absolute and the relative. Do you follow? Just a simple meaning of the binary words. And, uh, and therefore, there's no way of getting any place outside of the world is related to the world. So all these things you hear like, in the monotheism or in theologies of Western and Eastern, you hear a lot of stuff like that. Oh, God is absolute hell. Oh, sure, God is not bothered about anything in the world. No way, bro. But then he creates it without relating to it. <laughs> but that's just uh, dogmatic assertions, that sort of thing. It's not sensible. It's not meant to be sensible or realistic. So, point is that this the fear of enlightenment comes when one realizes, even ahead of time, about causality, one realizes that the causality thing means thing, that relativity is kind of infinite. And once relativity is infinite, then there has to be some way of being in relationship without suffering, blissful, in all, in all circumstances, logically speaking, unless there's no escape at all, and we just resign to just running around up and down in the cycle. <clears throat> so this guy at least thinks that there's a way of being blissful right here and now. And then they say later a lot of things like nirvana is you can't find the, they can't tell nirvana and samsara apart. This is nirvana. That's kind of a really strange idea. Isn't it? Right? Anybody feel like they're in nirvana? I mean, being in man lots close, but not, but not quite. So whatever we think nirvana is. So a spirit of enlightenment, however, are those who, even though they're not yet really sure what nirvana is, maybe not even sure there is such a thing, they realize they are interconnected with everyone. So therefore, the only way of it being nirvana is if everybody gets nirvana. Right? Because even you're blissful. Some other unblissful being there, like writhing in agony around you. That, you know, that's bad vibes. You know, that, that spoils the whole thing. You don't actually feel everything that the agony they're having, but the fact that they're having it bothers you, because your sensitivity and intelligence is like that, right? So that's the, so that spirit of enlightenment means you decide, I'm not going to shoot for a self-isolated nirvana. I'm going to shoot for everybody's nirvana, but mine, very much mine too, so it's enlightened self-interest. My nirvana depends on everybody having nirvana, and their having nirvana depends on mine having, so I'm going to get mine for them. Hmm. You follow? That's what the spirit of them, that's the bodhisattva attitude. Okay? 
And here he said, well, it's quite pretty to see, though. He says, so therefore bodhisattvas conceive the supreme spirit of enlightenment, carried away on the currents of four mighty streams, tightly bound by almost inescapable chains of evolution. That, that's how I translate karma. My friends don't like it. My fellow translators, well, you can't say, that, that's a biological biology word. And they, well, they can't feel it. Karma is a biological system. It's a description of the biology of life. It includes animals. I converted to at least respect of, of Asian people, one French intellectual professor, woman, very distinguished in the French Paris system, after first proving to her that she felt that Asian people who didn't know Darwin were backward. And they were, you know, they were like not really sophisticated and civilized. You know how French people are about being civilized. Left bang, go was, and I proved to her that for all her life she'd been studying people very sympathetically, but they were sort of, she was studying natives, you know, some natives. And then, and I proved it by showing that they are not like creationists in the United States, but weird white people in Texas who they ain't going to be related to no monkey. Uh, some female? No way. Uh, I'm coming from that white god. Yeah, whitey God. <laughs> I explained to her that every people in Asia, even with their caste systems or whatever they had, they all realized they had been monkeys, personally. <laughs> and they might be monkeys again if they screw up. <laughs> and they monkey around too much. And she realized, clicked, she realized that they had a Darwin type thing. Well, they had a spirit, they had a mind in it. You know, not just the genes and the, and the molecules and atoms, but a mind, whatever that is. The mind is part of the thing that forms the shapes of the life. That's biology. You know? And, and, and those materialists, they, to show that, they even agree, they ascribe a mind to the gene. It's either selfish, or it's enlightened, it's cooperative, or it's competitive. You know, they put the mind down in the gene. Genes kind of go somewhere. Why is the gene camera going somewhere? <laughs> well, the gene is just like a, it's A, B, C, D, it only has four letters. It's not really got a big conversation. <laughs> what wrong with them? Some molecules organizing, why bother? They just like hang out in, in, in molecule heaven. They don't need to be like some complicated, weird, like cockroach being chased around by, by, by like, uh, you know, Monsanto. <laughs> they don't care. So, they, they, they know there's a mind, there's an intention in reality. Yeah, there is. And that these people were, are like modern people. They're aware of their embeddedness in nature. That means they are really aware of what a mammal is. A mammal is a fantastic thing. A mammal has one half, the more enlightened half of the mammal species, the female one, is willing to share her body with these other beings. And not just humans, but tigers and lions, elephants. The elephants, they carry them around for years, don't they? How long are they in the womb, elephant? I think several years. Oh, poor thing. I mean, they might get rid of this, you know. Luckily, they don't have their weight check in a, in a <laughs> gynecology lab. Anyway. Never mind. Such, is, such is the state of all beings. They're all just your mothers. Then now, you take the beginninglessness of life, the fact of your having, once it's, in, it's beginningless, it's infinite, your past lives, the number, they're numberless. You've been every kind of life, we all have. And therefore, we've all been each other's mothers. Sorry. I apologize to every one of you. I was such a brat. I'm sure, I bit your nipples. <laughs> Badly. And I forgive you, you all were my children too. And I was a mom. Because you can't say you weren't enemies. We were enemies too, at different things, sure. But the best was when we were our each other's mothers, you know, as far as the one who was the child got the best deal, right? Mm -hmm. Poor mom said, oh, what happened to my little whatever it is? <laughs> anyway, just your mothers. That's why they say, the Tibetans say, all mother beings, all my mother beings. And they mean that, that they're connected like, uh, you that's what you meditate on. We'll do that. We'll do that, but not today. I was, I'm going to jump to wisdom.
So then you, anyway, you get to where you, you, uh, you really conceive the highest spirit, like you want them all, like just like your old mother of this life, if she's still there, you don't want her to suffer, you have a sense of duty, human beings do. You know, sometimes there were, there were difficult mothers we'd had, they'd been they were hard, giving us a hard time and so on, but somehow they were her mother, so we want to really take care of them. We have a natural feeling about it, so that we want to take care of all beings like that. That's the spirit of enlightenment. And then, but then, what is it you do with all beings? You don't necessarily want to be their mother again in another life and have to guide them to their piano lesson and, uh, and, uh, and the dentist and so on. No, you want them to, you want to usher them to enlightenment. You want to usher them to freedom from suffering. You want them to become free. They want them to be truly happy. Well, if you have that kind of a view that that's a possibility, right? Only in such cultures do, do, would a mom hold a child, like my guru's mother held him, and looked him down at him, and didn't say, I hope you grow up to be president of the United States. I didn't say, I hope you grow up to be a great this or that. Huh? She said, I hope you get to be a Buddha. She said to him, what's that, mom? <laughs> well, that's something special. Amazing, isn't it, wouldn't it be, to have a culture like that? Okay, but anyway, so then it says here, though you experience transcendence and cultivate the spirit of enlightenment. So you're dropped out, you're focusing on the subtle inner life, the most important part of life. You're really appreciating your value, you're intense in the moment, you don't waste the time because you know that they are limited, your time, it's, everything's impermanent. And further, you're doing it for everybody, so you're doing it interconnectedly with everybody, but you have those, without wisdom from realizing voidness or emptiness. Where's my bearded guy? I'll tell you. Without that wisdom, you cannot cut the root of cyclic life, so you should strive to realize relativity. Now, isn't that a shock? Relativity. Oh, wait, that was Einstein discovered relativity. No, he didn't. Buddha did. Emptiness and voidness don't mean nothingness. What they mean is all relational things are empty of any non relational thing. Do you follow me? Because if there was a non relational thing, sort of in relative things, then those things couldn't work, they couldn't relate. So emptiness means radical relativity. And what that is, is a challenge to our sense that there's something in here that is absolutely separate from it all. Right? That unchanging thing that I mentioned, sort of at the root of your awareness, that's somehow always you, it's identical always to itself, even though you're, some surface things all change, you have experiences, your body, your senses change, everything changes. Your molecules all change, but there's something unchanging in there, right? And similarly, at a more subtle plane, we reify, that's a great word, based on Latin, means make a thing out of things by saying the floor has a real floorness about it. You know, all philosophers have done that forever. There's a real thing in the atom. There's a, whatever it is, uh, the rug really has its own massive rugness, you know? We invest into things that our notions of them match some essence in them, if you follow me. So we kind of project out from the feeling that there's an essence in us, that's the real us, and it's Bob. It's my Bobhood. <laughs> and it never changes. It's always been Bob. And and uh, gets along by people calling it weird things like Dodo or something, but it's always Bob, really. And we projected that and everything has an essence like that in it. And so emptiness means that everything is empty of any such thing. And also the emptiness of the thing, of that sort of what they call an intrinsic reality in the thing, or a self in the thing, a self-subsistent self, a identical self, self-identity, there's all, they have very sophisticated linguistic ways of approaching it. And it being empty of that means it's all totally relational. It doesn't mean it's non-existent. It means it's relational. So there is a language that this and that doesn't exist. When Buddha gets in certain moods, in certain audiences, but what he's referring to there is the, the 
It doesn't exist in the way that we think it exists. Right? And they, when they say, I don't exist, it means that I, as that separate identity, don't exist. That means my relational self does exist as a purely relational thing, and there's no non-relational piece in it. That's what selflessness means. Do you follow? And actually it agrees with Vedanta, and so it's a general Indic discovery originally, and then it moves out and Zen everywhere, but there is this tendency about, about uh, and that I'm just mentioning that, but we'll go back on this in more detail, but it's just that I'm, we're running out of time, it's supposed to stop around quarter or a little before six. And, um, there is this thing uh, where, which uh, Tara Tuchel actually described in the most beautiful way of anybody that I ever heard describe it. I never saw it written like that at all, you know. You know, the Vinny knows what I'm talking about, Tara Tuchel, the old Tara Tuchel. And that is, we think our relational self, we have. We are a relational being, right? But we have been wrapped around where the core of our programming of our sense of self, has been wrapped around, we think, a thing in there that's the real thing, that never changes, an absolute self. Do you follow? This relational self that we are has sort of wrapped around what it assumes to be an absolute one. Or even though, of course, it's never contacted the absolute one because then it wouldn't be absolute. If you contact it, it's no longer absolute. Right? It becomes you because you related to it. You touched it. But there's still the feeling that it's there. It's like there's a, there's a guy with a gun behind the, the, around the corner. It's like, yeah, I'm absolutely terrified that there's this thing back there. Or there's a great thing back there, right? You follow me? So when we develop wisdom meditation, analytic vipassana, that's what vipassana is actually about, finally, not just mindfulness. Mindfulness is just the beginning level of it. But the real vipassana is, vipassana means seeing through something. V means by dividing it. So vipassana, seeing through, means looking everywhere in this, inside ourselves, in our mind, first of all in the body, in the brain, whatever, then really ultimately in the mind, and trying to find that, that thing that we feel is there, knowing that we feel that it's there, identifying that it's something we feel there. We feel that's absolute thing. I'm really me, don't give me that type thing. That, you know, I don't agree with you, but I'm here. You know, maybe other people are, I am. And then, but then really taking the challenge and looking for it, and then failing to find it. And then when you fail to find it, it's like you so much thought that was you, the area where you go deepest into yourself in failing to find it, is like a place like space. It seems as if the space where you thought it was is just empty. And you have an experience which is called space-like equipoised samadhi which somebody means super trance or concentration, transic concentration. So you have an experience of like vast, vastness, into which you sort of, your sense of identity disappears, and you disappear, and your sense of relationalities disappear, and everything sort of just is gone. And it's like the experience of, it's like the meditation of infinite space. But, but it's a little different from that one, but that, you know, I'm, I don't, don't worry, but there is one that you can have where it's like that and yet you feel you're having it. But in this one, you don't even feel you're having it. You really disappear. You go downstream. And you, and what Taratopo said is that the relative self has been so entwined with the presumed absolute self that when the absolute self is discovered not to be there, to be empty of it, it sort of drags the relative self with it and there's an experience of disappearing. And therefore there's a fear. When you develop, to develop that deep wisdom, there's a fear of the, you're gonna lose yourself in a vast abyss, or you, know, you don't know, you lose control, you give up, you let yourself go. And then it's very critical though, from in Buddha's education system, it's very critical that you realize that even though you experience a self-dissolution, and, you know, in Zen, that experience can be called, sometimes called the great death. You know, it's like a death. But even when you do that, that's still a relational experience. You disappeared because you thought you were there. 
then you disappear. And it seems like there's nothing to be related or not related. But that still, but then, and then, you sort of have no control over the momentum of the critical, you know, momentum of the critical concentration, you know, the, the transit critical concentration, looking for this absolute thing, that then you may think that that disappeared thing is the absolute thing. <laughs> and actually many people do. And many people think that's it. Obliteration is the goal. And then, and they even think that. People who are members of these traditions, they think that. And they act like that. And then other people say, well, that's sort of selfish, and they don't care. <coughs> well, so your enlightenment is just you just withdrew yourself from the equation. You just withdrew from your, you let yourself be obliterated. That's, obliteration is, is the goal. So then, then uh, the, the problem with that four people, or the lucky ones, are the ones who it, it ends. You have that meditation. There's a, a one Zen guy, Han Shan, Cold Mountain. He was stirring porridge after like years of retreat on this cold mountain. He was stirring. He had managed to get some gruel or ice cream. He was stirring it, and then, as he stirred it, suddenly, it had congealed. It was all dry, and there was three days of dust on the surface of it. But to him, it was one continuous motion. But then he realized suddenly that it wasn't moving smoothly anymore. He realized that he disappeared for three days. Because, you know, he was all like, looking for the real reality. You know, he was like Zen, you know, with all in retreat, you know, but trained and then and then doing the full thing. So, he, so that, there's no time in a, in a state of obliteration. So you're out of it, the minute you're in it. Do you ever have sodium pentothal in the dentist? I am a super escapist, and it always pisses me off. Because, you know, you're about to have a tooth pull. I don't, have, I don't have that many left, but I had some pull. And uh, occasionally, once or twice, had some pentothal. And I was like, oh, great, getting a buzz. I'm going to be obliterated for a while. Oh, great, I don't have to worry about translating all the Buddhist literature. <laughs> Just getting rid of the oil industry, and whatever it is. So I don't have to worry about it. And, oh, it's great. And then, you have no experience of not being there, and the nurse is like, okay, now get up and chew on this piece of cotton, and we have all the patients, you know. Uh, no sense of being out, there, out of there. Nothing. It's really frustrating. But then uh, there are people, then they run around, oh, I realized emptiness. I'm enlightened. I have a Cadillac now. I want some disciples. I'm a guru now. And then they go crazy. Then the Zen are good. You know, Zen actually, they have produced a bunch like that. Uh, you know, Zenies who go wrong. But, but the basic tradition calls that being caught in the demon ghost cave, where where you think you've realized emptiness and you're therefore higher than other people. Whereas Buddha is the servant of others. There's nobody's higher. Well, I, that's why I started this today saying, they translated Guru as Lama. And Lama is actually translated Anuttara, not, not Guru. But they use it to translate Guru. And Anuttara means you can't get past it. It's unsurpassable. So their idea of Guru, the Tibetans, was not someone on top of you, although some of them act like that. So I'm not saying that they're immune as a whole. But the language, at least, is pushing them towards seeing Guru as a, the mentor, the teacher, the, the, the spiritual teacher, as someone who, when you encounter, you can't get past them. You know, you, you, your, your self-fullness encounters their selflessness, and then you begin to find your selflessness. In other words, you discover yourself. It's like, as I like to say, it's rather than it's like the good, the good, real, the Tibetan view of the guru is tar baby. You know that thing you, you try to get rid of it and you pick it up and you're stuck to it. And then, oh no, and you try to throw it away and you're more and more stuck to it, right? Isn't that tar baby? What is that? That pogo? Or what is that? Uncle Ray. Uncle Ray. What was it? Some, some folk tale we had. Anyway, so guru is tar baby. And no tell you can't get past the guru. He isn't higher. He's like inside you. Because he's inside the reality. Now, 
you know, I should just say, so we'll come, want to come back to the details of this emptiness, especially these four verses. You might read them yourself. Who sees the causality of things up to, as experience spells absolutism and voidness cleans away nihilism. Those four verses are the most amazing verses in Tibetan. And in English, they're not bad, but I'm, I probably will be changing them more before I finally settle for it, or who knows. But they're, they're really perfectly good on this topic, on wisdom. You know? But I just want to say that the Buddha's enlightenment, you know, they say, is where, when you become a Buddha, I'll put it this way, when you, any of you become Buddha, and all of us will, inevitably, because we, we're here forever anyway. So finally we'll decide we might as well. Nobody gets out of here. There's no escape from life. You know. So therefore, we're, we're here. And then we find decide, well, the optimal way to be here, right, is where you're one with everybody. Not what I call the cheap oneness, which is where you and they have all disappeared. It's all one and there's nothing there. And you had it, it felt like one though, because they disappeared too. So, so we're all one. Oh, that's so great. But we're one in our disappearance. That's really the cheap one. The expensive one is we're all one, and each one has their own differentiated, related, relational being. And you're one with all of that, and in the way they are. How about that? That's expensive. Because <laughs> they're so diverse, and there's so many out there. Not just the humans either, all beings. And so, so what Buddhahood means is it's this weird idea. Now, that may seem weird to you that you can feel one with another being, but it isn't, of course, because you've been in love sometime in your life. Maybe some of you are now in love, right? When you fall in love, you have an unfortunately often temporary experience of being one with the beloved. And even their being becomes more important to you than your own being. And then somehow, when you don't feel that as a put down, you don't feel bad about that. You're like Gene Kelly dancing in the rain because you're in love, right? So we've all, we can expand our sense of identity to enfold another being. Mothers, of course, expand it to enfold the being first who is in the condo in her stomach and her belly. And then later when they're outside, it's a little less, but still very much identifies with them for life. So human being has this ability, that's one of our greatnesses about our program, reprogrammability. We can expand our sense of identification. So a Buddha is then uh, defined as someone who has expanded that infinitely, where they identify with all beings, with all life. And they feel they are all of the life. They feel that. And they somehow, in feeling it, when they feel it, they feel it from a level of where they see that the essence of the energy of life is abundant bliss. So they see the beings as configurations of that bliss. They don't see them as not existing, they see them as configurations of bliss. And then they cannot avoid seeing them at the same time as not being aware of that themselves. Do you follow? So the Buddha mind then sees them as all right, because they're made, in other words, why are molecules and cells and genes and all these things, these wonderful things that they discover on the coarse level, by of course I mean the post-quantum level, the non-quantum level, not the level of where wave-particle paradox means that you can't tell whether something's a wave or a particle, and there's no particles actually. There is a level of subtle reality like that according to Buddhist physics. And, and the subtle mind, your, our subtle minds go there. They are there, actually. Our bodies are there. That's what's called a real super subtle body. There's a subtle body that still sort of connects to the neural structural end, but then there's a super subtle body. And super subtle body is everywhere and not in any of the, not trapped in any molecule. It's a pure, clear light energy, something like that. That's Buddhist physics which I think connects very well now with, with, uh, with quantum physics. So for, for when people who are not projecting their own ego into what they, their effort of finding of matter, you know, what they think of as matter. When they get to that boundary where they can't, they know there's energy, but there's no matter. And then they, they don't know what to do with it. That's why they got so excited last year, two years ago. Higgs boson! 
Hey man, we found the Higgs boson. So we know that's why there's mass. I don't know if you remember that. But in all those newspaper articles with which they were justifying their $15 billion subway under the territory of Switzerland, they were saying, at the end of each article, it said, well, but now there's all this dark energy, dark matter. <laughs> we don't know what that is. That's the yin. They don't know where the yin is, all those yang characters. <laughs> so my point is, so what a Buddha is, so what a Buddha is, is a being that sees, that takes everybody with them in seeing their deepest nature as being blissful. At the same time as their, that's their wisdom. And their compassion, the knowing of their deep, their real reality, their higher reality. It's still a relative reality, but it's higher relative reality. And then, and then simultaneously, compassion remains sensitive to the fact that they don't feel like that. They are suffering. And therefore, that becomes the most effective possible being to help them unravel the trap of delusion in which they have trapped themselves from beginningless time in a sense of being disconnected from everything and trying to fight it off, right? If you think you're absolutely different from other things at your deep level of your unconscious level where you have this sense of fixed identity that's separate from everything, but somehow still you're somehow connected to it all, but it's all different, it's just as absolutely not you as you are absolutely you. You put yourself, you are in an impossible situation. Temporarily someone loves you, temporarily a few people are nice to you, temporarily you're safe. But overall, you're going to die sick, it's in different numbers of other like weird aliens, Republicans, all kinds of people, they're going to get you, take away your social security, take away your everything. They're going to do it, they're going to ruin your planet. Once you're separate from them. If you are everything, you don't be afraid of any of it. You're not afraid of it. Even the bad guys are made of bliss. They just don't know it, really. Even in their third triple-story apartment, all gold-plated, you know, we're sitting around with a bunch of people who obviously don't like them. They, they are looking for bliss somewhere else. Maybe I'll have bliss when I have a trillion. Because I don't have it with fake billion. Or even the guys with 40 billion, they don't have it. Not at all. Okay, so I just wanted to reassure you with that. <laughs> <laughs> but that is possible, according to the Buddha, according to millions of people since him. That is what we can become. According to actually India, 1500 years, India transformed itself, all the many nations of India, by this presence. And they became vulnerable, actually. And they got conquered by a bunch of, like, you know, weirdos, violent people, you know, who were not violent because they felt they had the emotional plague. They were trapped. They didn't have their inner bliss. They didn't know their inner bliss. They had it. They were it, but they didn't know that. So they thought it was something they had to dominate and trap and catch, and wealth would give it to them, and a new land would give it to them. And more whatever, more bigger harem would give them, and none of it worked. But then they conquered them. And Tibet, but luckily Tibetans kept it alive. And, and Hinduism has it. Hinduism, oh, Vedic, Vedic, we're all Vedic. No. Vedas is maybe some element, but the Shramanas, you know, the dropouts really created Hinduism. Vegetarianism did not come from the Vedas. Nonviolence did not come from the Vedas. Yoga, did not come from the Vedas. They were, they were just getting stoned and doing rituals, yeah. sacrificing animals early, early on, and even humans, horses, you know, Ashwamedha, you know, they had, there was a sacrificialist ritual culture. They needed a bunch of dropouts to cheer them up. <laughs> but they did. But then when people get too cheery in past history, then someone, has, someone who's less cheery tends to come and trample on them. <laughs> up to now. Now the cheery ones are going to win. Because the non-cheery ones are going to wake up that they're just going to destroy themselves if they keep it up. Really. They're going to wake up to that. Definitely. There's no way out. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.
This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special invites to trips around the world with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, please visit TibetHouse.us.